Welcome to the Future of Tourism podcast. I'm David Peacock. Stop owning your own content. Young leaders are stepping up. Bring everyone to the table. And imagine their world anew. Destinations International Advocacy Summit is an important milestone every year. Far and away, the most interesting presentation this year for me was Aspen, Colorado's presentation on their innovative work with the consulting group Clarity of Place on capacity, compression, and comfort. In its simplest term, it's an investigation into a destination's capacity, the effects of compression, and the comfort point that represents a good balance that sees residents, businesses, and visitors happy and well served. Eliza Voss is the Vice President Destination Marketing at the Aspen Chamber Resort Association. She's a graduate of Gettysburg College, she loves the place she lives, and she's a strong advocate of engaged communities that take an active role in destination planning and development. David Holder is a principal with the Clarity of Place Consulting Group, and prior to the founding COP with Tina Valdecanis, he was part of the Global Tourism and Destinations Team at JLL Hotels Group. Good morning, both of you. How are you? Where are you? What's it like? You first, uh, Eliza, please. I am here at home. Well, not at home, at the office in Aspen, Colorado. Um, and we have recently had about 12 inches of snow. So the stoke is high here. David Holder, I know you're not at home. That's not your usual background. Where are you? What's it like? So I am uh, up the road from Eliza a bit. I'm in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, uh, doing a few workshops here. So we're looking forward to uh, all of these conversations, David. Super. Um, I, I really want to jump in to capacity, comfort, and compression. But first, I want to ask you both uh, the same question I asked myself, which is, what was the most important or impressive thing at advocacy in Minneapolis this year? Who wants to go first? I'll go first because I'm a little bit of a sneak that I was in Bloomington prior to Advocacy Summit at my final CME course but I ducked out um, prior to the summit. So my only attendance was the, <laughs> my session virtually. What was, what was your CDME? It was advocacy with Deb Archer and John Groh um, and really great insights there and love the peer-to-peer -peer le learning. Yeah, you, you kind of got the A team on that one, Deb and, <laughs> Deb and John. That's a, yeah, they're always, always great. David, um, you were there, what did you see? Well, let's see. My favorite part was uh, the afterglow that we took a little group to Surly Brewing, and uh, it was awesome. We had some fantastic conversations, just you know, kind of that that getting people out of the conference a little bit and having a, a a nice time, still talking business. But I'm always a big fan of the shirt sleeve sessions. You know, the, those round tables. You learn as much from the people sitting around the table with you as you do from anyone who's up on the stage. Uh, everyone's been through some type of ringer and being able to share that and kind of let down their guard a little bit, uh, that's always that big takeaway of, you know, what are, what are we walking away with? So I do, I do, I am interested in knowing how long before Eliza Voss is the, uh, uh, the, the teacher of the advocacy uh, class though for CDME. Uh, I don't think, okay, given our next subject, I'm not sure it'll be long, um, but that, that let's, let's transition to compression, compression, comfort, and capacity. I go to advocacy to figure out where we're at as an industry, what the read is on where we're at in terms of acting. The good news is we've all turned a corner. Um, COVID compounded with issues around equity, diversity, with sustainability and regeneration. Those are less academic by a long shot these days every destination is looking to get ready to start to work on those tranches and that means a shift internally to a more resident and more citizen and more stakeholder focus that's why your presentation got my attention we need tools we need tools to put in the hands of dmos so that they can begin the kind of engagement that will grow and grow because i look at 2030 and i know by then the engagement of a destination organization will be significantly broader, deeper, and more meaningful than it will be today. So I'm excited about your product. Um, Eliza, where did it come from? Um, what is it? You know, um, give us, give us a, a look at that. And David, I'll, I'll let you add some color. 
I'm going to throw up a couple of slides here, and I, I wouldn't usually do that in future tourism. But there was a moment when I looked at your at your um, your um, range slide between compression and capacity and, and, a, and a comfort piece, and I got it. So I'm going to throw that up there. If you're watching the podcast, great. You'll get to see it. If you're not and you're on Anvil, Spotify, or iTunes, um, go to the Simple View blog and actually read the blog because the, 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 the graphic's worth it. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to you, Eliza. Um, uh, what is it? Where did it come from? Thanks. Um, so in 2021, we kicked off a destination management plan process with Destination Think, which involved quite a lot of community engagement. Um, we had 1,299 resident surveys. We did tourism town halls. We did co-creation labs, desk side research, et cetera. Simultaneously, we received a grant from the Colorado Tourism Office to identify a priority tourism need and then utilize 75 hours of technical assistance to, you know, basically function as an extension of our team to be able to um, work on this priority tourism need. So through the engagement sessions with Destination Think as part of the overarching destination management plan, and then following up with the core team um, that was part of our um, Colorado Tourism Office grant, we I de this, this notion of kind of protecting off seasons and identifying off peak within peak time frames kind of came to the forefront as something that we needed to be able to identify. So, um, you know, it was clear that our residents were saying, we don't in fact want you to extend the season. We want to enjoy that downtime, but then there are kind of times of year when the tourism infrastructure is in place, but we have capacity to take people in. And in those times, ACRA, our organization, should act as a marketing organization. And in the other times of the year, when we are kind of in that comfort range, then we shift to management. So that's how we identified what we needed was to try and figure out with um, Clarity of Place Holder through the CTO grant, how to identify those time periods throughout the year. That's excellent. Um when you threw it up there, you defined three terms at that advocacy, capacity, compression, and comfort. David, you want to walk us through a little bit of the the thinking behind those, and then we'll we'll shift over to the metrics graphic. Yeah, that's actually uh, a, a great way to approach this. And one of because so many destinations have gone through that that situation where they're hearing from their residents, we're being overwhelmed by these guests, you know, that we're putting so much emphasis on uh, businesses that, and, and, and the visitors. What about us as residents? And as we really started breaking down the conversation with, with Aspen, we, we recognized it really starts with capacity. We need to understand what's the, the volume that the destination is capable of accommodating. And then from there, let's see how that volume is actually being met. And, and that became the compression piece. So capacity, if we understand how much we can take, and then we put that against how much we're actually achieving, then the next piece is understanding that uh, this, this idea of comfort becomes the new goal. Uh, and I, 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 I came on through the, the ranks, uh, as so many of us uh, destination leaders did, that uh, at one point in time, pre-pandemic, the goal was 100%. We want we want 100 of our rooms filled. We want 100 of our seats filled in restaurants. We want 100 of our uh, arts and and performing uh, facilities filled. It's all 100. percent At this point, that's not comfortable. So determining where comfort lives is probably the new goal that we need to be seeking in 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 our destinations. And comfort is a kind of a balance between what our residents feel is comfortable and what our businesses need to be successful. And success doesn't necessarily mean that we're uh, maxing the whole thing out. So you start down this path of, of investigating. And, and Eliza, this is a big step out of marketing. I really, I really like the thinking behind this, and we're gonna drill into that. But you step out of the, the sort of mainstream path of, of marketing. You start doing something investigative that has a real impact. You rip the Band-Aid off the comfort question. 
And I've done that myself. Um, it's interesting to do it with businesses and it's interesting to do it with city councils. It's tremendously interesting to do it with residents. Um, what did that look like? We have a very passionate community. So we heard, we heard it um, and it was good. You know, it can be scary to go down that path, but um, it's actually not anything you don't know, right? Cause you live in your community. So you've heard it before on the street. Um, but to have the data really there and then be able to try and actionize against it is really helpful. And I think creating this tool will be even more helpful because, you know, even just rolling out the destination management plan, which suggested backing off on the off seasons, we have heard from businesses that that isn't what they want to see. And so to have a tool that you can rely on that is not just a few opinions or one loud opinion, but to actually rely on looking at a calendar and utilize that and make data-driven decisions on how you're going to market and manage and kind of pivot between those two roles throughout the year. Um, I don't know. I feel like it, it really, it's, it's using the data versus using the emotions, which yeah. is helpful. The, okay. Just, and just, just since we're all out here living this, the emotions piece can be pretty intense at times. So there is to say there's a latency for citizens to have a voice in tourism is probably an understatement. And my my own personal experience would be one of the first things you want to cork is the two edges of the bell curve, the you know, the, the total supporters and the total detractors. You gotta have some intestinal fortitude as a destination organization to do that, don't you? <laughs> you, you sure do. Um and I think, you know, we have a unique position in that we are a well-established destination. So we're not emerging. So people do understand that we are, you know, tourism-based economy, but certainly um, as everybody has seen through COVID that it, we had increased residents and increased second homeowners spending more time here. So it became not just a tourism issue, but just like the, the capacity the town was feeling um, could not just be blamed on one thing anymore. Okay, let's let's talk more about how you measure that capacity. I'm going to throw up the the second slide here that I want to look at, and it's the one that you kind of blew my mind with. It's always fun to go to a you know a fairly staid uh, event and have your mind blown. So this was good. <laughs> um, I saw this, and it just really spoke to me. Now, in here is a lot of the gymnastics and mechanics of getting to a comfort reading but david walk us through what we're looking at here yeah the the, the biggest piece on this so it every destination organization if they're not looking at compression uh they should be uh but that's pretty much the standard that measurement that we're all using what's the volume of business that we're actually accommodating within our community what's left out of that though is the capacity piece uh and and that's kind of where we begin seeing a change in the conversation with our residents and with our businesses. So in the case of October of uh, 2021 in Aspen, we saw, we saw a range of, of, of capacity uh, with our airline seats and our overnight stays. Uh, our, our overnight stays had room for growth, but our airline seats were fully maxed out. So that could either mean that we either shift our attention to more drive markets or, or we really focus on building additional air service opportunities and, air, and different routes. So there's decision-making that comes out of a tool like this. The, the comfort piece is really the defining mark that allows us to understand what does this mean going forward? And you know, for, for Aspen, when we initially did this, it was based on a projection. You know, right? I'm, we're having to, to, to guesstimate where that comfort level is Aspen's going through, uh, Eliza's leading uh, this through ACRA, going through resident sentiment right now and going through additional stakeholder uh, assessments to understand, you know, is there a way that we can actually measure what that looks like? And David, you're completely right. The polar ends of the spectrum, if I'm a business and I want to just max it out, we've got to discount that from the equation. And if I'm a resident, I say, absolutely no tourists. Uh, they're, they're just a, a, a pain. We just need to get rid of them. That's not realistic either. So somewhere in the middle is where comfort lives. So the comfort we're looking here right now, you guys literally are parametrically still playing with this. Eliza, you've got 
more engagements, you're adding in data pieces. David, you've talked about adding in data pieces, but this is a first look at some historical data, October 2021, and you can play with this. You're also zeroing in on, on real-time sort of assessments in order to be able to help you make uh, decision-making. Eliza, you talked about just now about more intakes, and you've talked to me before about um, moving this towards real time. There's a lot more data here um, needed to do all of that. But again, this is right at the beginning, but this is the step in the right direction. Tell me about what you're working on. So we have introduced this to our board of directors and um, very high level to the community. And I think um, I have seen that I need to socialize this idea of comfort a little bit more with businesses um, because at DI and other events around the industry, I think we as a travel industry have come to understand that comfort is important. The residents are, you know, finally getting their say in everything. And um, so I, I am noticing I'll need to socialize it more with businesses that actually long term comfort is a very sound business decision um, because we don't want to basically overrun um, the golden goose. Um, so that's, you know, I've realized that that's something we need to work on as we continue to add these data points to it is just trying to kind of socialize the idea with our business community. So, but as you, as you try then to become more accurate and more consistent in your predictive um, forecasting using comfort, you need new data on comfort at the citizen level. That's interesting. It's, it's not completely numerical, although it can have, you know, NPI and net promoter score type stuff in it. But what kind of stuff are you doing there at the citizen level? We are right now running a resident survey with destination analysts to gauge their sentiment level and trying to kind of probe around that, um, that comfort and capacity with, through questions with them. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a very engaged community. We had nearly 1,300 with the destination thing survey. We're at 1,900 now. So people are telling us how they feel. That's that's <laughs> that's fantastic. That's great. And um, <clears throat> the hard thing is, you do you start to realize really quickly once you jump on this horse, you don't jump off. Like this is this just grows from here, right? Yes. I mean, I think we'll probably be doing resident engagement surveys. Um, at least every six months for the foreseeable future. And then we're also doing business stakeholder surveys as well to gauge that piece of the um, equation. So I think we have this goal of 360 degree feedback and it's going to be 365. <laughs> have you had to, have you had to replumb your chart of accounts? I mean, you're buying stuff that's not usually on the books. <laughs> Luckily, tax receipts were up this year, so we were able to accommodate some additional research. Way to go, way to go. All right, David, you've talked about other data sources, and, and I, I, I see this. This is like a jet engine prototype on a bench. It's amazing. You're looking at growing it. Talk about other data in a real-time data world. We know we've got access to inbound. We know we've got fairly decent uh, highways and tolls data. What, as we build this out in the future, are you looking at? So, so I think the, the best way to answer that question is to kind of start with what's, what was the model intention? And, and we needed some type of tool to help Aspen visualize what was really going on. You know, they, they were besieged with conversations based on perceptions and feeling and not necessarily based on fact. And there's a way to really show what's really what's actually happening. Um, so it's it's fairly easy to pull in the lodging piece. Uh, it's fairly easy to pull in airline seats. Getting that down, you know, at the, at the monthly level is doable. Getting it into a daily level becomes wow. That's that's an incredible resource to have. We start adding in attractions. You know, Aspen is able to track to track a lot of different information sources. So they can track. Uh, shuttle rides to some of their primary attractions. They can track things like ticket sales to some of their primary cultural venues. Um, or if we've had conversations with the ski area to see if there's a way we can put the capacity on even lift tickets. Um, so those are conversations that are still forthcoming. Uh, what really got us all excited is we know 
uh, that part of compression isn't just our guest, it's our residents too. And that gets left out of the equation often, uh, especially if we're only looking at overnight stays in short-term rentals or hotels. So we needed some way to start that conversation and everyone got overly excited perhaps when we started talking about flushes. Uh, so we started talking about sewer system uh, volume, what we're actually able to handle. Uh, turns out Aspen can handle 3 million gallons a day. Um, so we need to, to think about what, how does that factor into this? So uh, it was at that that's point we knew we were on That's something. comfortably 3 million Co gallons a day. No, that's, that's actual total volume. You get to 3 total million, volume. you got an issue. <laughs> and so it's so not where, an issue. <laughs> where does that fit on the range? Uh, that, that would be capacity. That's okay. a capacity you don't want to hit. Yeah, indeed. So when you when you developed the first iteration of this, and, and we got to see a really early version of it, of it at, at advocacy, there is a moment, as I said, when you look at it, you go, "Wow, this is this is cool." You know, this is cool. You know, it's going to get some traction. Mm -hmm. Eliza has the tool supplied you with the same sort of traction back home are you able to use this and can you see people starting to understand what you're talking about are you is the tool helping you in that sense already i was so excited i nearly jumped out my seat when i saw it visualized but <laughs> me too um, but uh and i think like hoteliers and those types of business owners that are used to looking at numbers and capacity regularly got it right away um, but we are still on for the smaller and we haven't really rolled it out to residents so that they understand that we're working that we heard what they said and that we're trying to find data to apply that um, we presented very short version of it to our business community um, but we do need to do like a resident outreach with it well I'm kind of excited about that because I'm looking at this still on my screen and it's two dimensions. And I don't know if you're going to overlay residence as a, an opaque Uber layer or as a Y, a, a Z dimension to your X, Y graph. It's <laughs> going to be very, so I, I can see, and it's going to be very interesting how you present that because there will, the comfort range you've defined here is pretty much decide, decided as a supply demand thing. It's very, it's very transactional. Now you're adding in residence. I can see a bunch of ways that you can do that. I'm excited. I, I can't wait to see this iteration of it. Yeah, Dave, one of the things that we're thinking through right now is some, are, are there some alternative ways to visualize this? You know, kind of thinking also, you know, it's built so we can accommodate more and more data sources. But um, one of the other pieces, and this is one of the reasons that I love working with the ACRA team, um, they've, they've got this, you know, really strong foundation with communications and being able to think about all of those different communication messages that have to come out of this. Um, and it's kind of ironic that Eliza mentioned her favorite part of Advocacy Summit was the advocacy CDME class. And this becomes a, a real strong advocacy tool going forward. But because it's just a tool, it needs that plan behind it. It needs that marketing plan. How do we release this to uh, our, our residents? How do we release it to our elected officials? How do we put this in the hands of our businesses? So the businesses are also talking about, look, it's not what you're perceiving. We have room for growth in this particular arena and we need help with that. If we don't make that happen, our businesses are at risk and our community's livelihood is at risk. So um, it, it's part of that ongoing message that we need to think about is that this is a tool we need to continue to think of it as a tool. We need to know that no tool is perfect. It can always be uh, refined and unless it's a wheel, wheel's perfect. Yeah. So if we, but this is definitely not a wheel. So if we can just keep, keep that momentum going, keep building it, keep adding to it and keep looking for other ways to visualize it. I think we're gonna be onto something that's going to have a, a, a real nice lifespan. David, you are speaking in a way that is, uh, predictive of, of a of a you know an Aspen Chamber engagement model that that three years from now four years from now looks so different it has so many smaller but integral moving parts Eliza talk to me about that talk about four years out when you're successful with this and you've got a citizen coalition is you know maybe it's a committee maybe it's a group you've got 
businesses. They're they're sinking. They're working on things. Um, I can tell you from my work at RTL4, when we've accomplished versions of that, the exciting part isn't even just the things we're able to fix. It's a, the ideas that come out of it. I mean, David, you've seen some of the animation pieces in Ontario. Stratford, you know, animating like mad. Laura Fergus doing its own signage and histories projects as citizen committees. Eliza, what do you see, you know, four years out in, in your best case scenario? Well, it sounds like you just described DMO utopia. Um, <laughs> so let's hope we get there because I, I do think, um, you know, we were fa facing many of these kind of challenges as a community even prior to COVID, um, like the restrictions on workforce, which ha is connected into this capacity piece. So I think, and we have a very high ADR right now, but we're facing the same workforce challenges that everybody else is. So in that four year time period, I hope that we can be using this not only as my organization as a tool, the community as a tool to understand that that comfort is in fact the goal and that it is the long range that that is the long range success plan for the community to to ensure that um, we can continue to welcome guests to our community in the way that they should enjoy the community because you know it's comfort really is being driven by the residents right at this point but actually the guest experience should be comfortable as well um, so I, I mean, I'm striving towards that utopia that you just described. <laughs> well, it is, and, and the comfort isn't just the guest; it becomes shared. But you, when you when you mention workforce, wow, that is another interesting data piece here because it is, in some sense, at points in time, an inelastic wall. Like you, you know, you can you can want you can have more rooms and you can have plenty of willing visitors and no capacity at a service level. They're a very interesting point to add that in. That just speaks more and more to the to the potential growth of this. All right. Um David if, David, if I could, the, that please. that the the piece with workforce and some of those other issues. You you mentioned the what's what's the Z uh axis look like? That's that's got to be the Z axis. That I think so. we need I think these so. indicators that are showing kind of what is our what is our volume to either handle more capacity or handle more compression? Um, and that volume is not necessarily based on a, a number of seats or a number of beds or you know anything like that. It's based on you know can can we actually serve the guests that we are accommodating? And I will you know one of the areas where we see an opportunity with this. We talked about this from a, an advocacy standpoint. One of the decision points that a tool like this allows a community to do is begin making development decisions for the future. So now it's not just, you know, Aspen looked at this from a sense of we are we are a destination that's feeling some strain in terms of our visitor volume, but there's a real applicability to this model for destinations that's trying to figure out what's the next layer of what we need. Do we need to add a full service hotel? Do we need to add you know, in addition to our convention center, do we need uh, new sports facilities? It becomes a, a, a management tool, decision-making tool to guide some of that decision because you still have a capacity issue, you still have a competitive issue, you still have this idea of are we generating uh, the, the new business to a, that our inventory can actually absorb? Well, Dave, you touch on data-driven decision-making. Um, and I know you're both heavily involved in the sustainability regeneration file and thinking about that on a go-forward basis. It's so obvious there that data and information and the use of it judiciously will play a huge role in our reducing waste, uh, you know, matching consumers with vendors and, and things like that. This is the beginning of that, realizing there's multiple data sources that have to be linked together intelligently, reduce duplication. I mean, Jeff Katz was on the founder of Sabre talking about it. He predicts a world where these, you know, if 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 part of our sustainability goal is, is a four-fifths reduction in certain consumption, we need all of the coordination we can get. This is the beginning of that, isn't it, Eliza? Yes, we. It, everything has to be so cohesive and 
um, that's actually one of the goals of our organization is like acknowledging all of the all of the parts of the pieces, not just of Aspen, but the entire valley that we're living in is interconnected um, and trying to find some sort of harmony and balance with that. And then, you know, goes for environmental as well as social, as well as, um, you know, the economics of, yeah. Perfectly well said. Okay, that's the best thought of the day. So let's leave that on this. I do have one more <laughs> question. Um, David, if you had one question for Eliza that you've never asked or wanted to ask, what is it? And Eliza, back back at you. This is a three-way conversation. Jeez, oh, what a uh, what kind of hard question is that? Uh, I I I I think the world of Eliza. I think she is just brilliant, and I I, I just want to know what's next for her. It's it's she's just got such a a great foundation with what she's built. With a lot of support in Aspen, um, Aspen is better because she's there. That wasn't a question, but that's my my statement. Was, I guess it was rhetorical. Eliza, <laughs> any questions for David? That was very kind. Um, I just really hope that this tool is like the the rocket ship for clarity of place to just like be able to I, when he presented it to us i was like this is so cool i'm so glad i'm in right now because i'm sure in 10 years it might cost quite a lot of money for you just to allow me to use this tool also you know, not a question these were not questions <laughs> these, these were, you guys are terrible at questions you guys would lose on jeopardy you must put your answer in the form of a question um no listen i i appreciate the, the mutual admiration it is really big and it's great and i think one of the reasons it works is you're both super open-minded open-minded about sharing things and letting the industry bring what it's got by the time we've got the data sources we need by the time we've got daily um airline arrivals that we could work with and room stuff that's on a, on par we'll be working with so many partners there's a lot of work to do here and i think you both embody the spirit of moving moving this industry forward so there's there's my compliment to both of you and i guess we can end on that so that's a good place to end i like this all right cheers guys thanks a lot for sharing i think this has been really great thank you